How are you feeling today? Better? All right. Yeah, I think it was the... Uh... <clears throat> I had some duck stew that I thought I would uh, extend a little by adding mm -hmm. beans and bacon. I think the bacon was that combination anyway, that syrupy type of maple bacon. Mm. And then the uh, something sweetened in the beans kind of hit me in the wrong spot, I guess. So, right. But it, something that tastes good that just doesn't agree with you <laughs> <laughs> right well thank you for coming on um for those that don't know this gentleman is antoine mountain um so antoine is an author a musician um you've done a lot of visual art i believe as well you're currently doing your phd and a tom long tom longboat award winner which is the best indigenous athlete in the country. Am I missing anything from your, uh, I think I am. I'm sure you've done a million things. Uh, probably a dozen other things, but uh, part-time uh, cook and a sufferer of uh, digestive indignations as such. Right, right. So, yeah, well, we might touch on some of the other things too. Right. Also a, um, a Hall of Fame member of Sport North. So uh, Sport North, for people that don't know, um, helps support the TSOs in the Northwest Territories. And they inducted you uh, a number of years ago into their Hall of Fame for your athletic achievements as well. Uh, it was a really good uh, sign of support from one of the other uh, residential school survivors, a good friend of mine named John Selly. Legislative Assembly for representing South Q for a number of years. Uh, I guess all this time he was uh, a super fan, which was really useful for me because we were roommates in high school at residential school there in Fort Smith. And we often went out running, even though we did exercises as a group uh, in Grandin College at the time we, we got up earlier and ran outside uh, because we wanted to get that fresh air and uh, anyway it's one of the daily situations we had at the time so I'm really grateful that he uh, acted as reference for the NWT Sports Hall of Fame. Yeah for um for a little more background uh so you were born hope you don't mind me mentioning but uh your year uh you're born the same year as my dad actually in 1949 and you were you were forced into residential school when i believe you were about eight years old seven actually oh, uh somewhere in there we didn't really keep track of uh years as much in our then away but uh mm -hmm. up until that point uh well, one of the things that people don't really realize about residential schools is that the grandparents try to keep some of the uh, their favorite gen grandchildren behind. And one of the things we did was uh, we went way up in the mountains, uh, um, <clears throat> camping up there. And I was probably on one of the very last... Uh, moose hide boats that went down the rivers towards uh, the Cho, towards the um, Duhoka Mackenzie River. Mm -hmm. So I got to experience that part of it. And I'm really glad it did because one of the main things that happens with residential schools is uh, an overriding sense of apathy within survivors. Uh, there's been a large number of probably over 20 suicides out of uh, Grolier Hall, which was probably one of the most nefarious of all residential schools in the North with all the uh, sexual type of uh, crimes that were committed upon the students there by supervisors. So that sense of apathy that I was mentioning, it's, it's really deeply ingrained. Well, obviously not to the point of uh, suicide amongst all survivors, but that sense of 
not wanting to share anything of the past, even though some of my very best friends and family members went, went through exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Two of them are picking up on the concept of writing that is uh, leaving some kind of a trace. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with that being uh, a media type of a person is that it's really valuable to re record your thoughts because even in the technical process of doing so, you, you are solving some of those, uh, let's say, remnants of apathy or lack of knowledge of some, some of the details that you need to pick up on to be a complete uh, communicator, let's say. Mm -hmm. And in this particular case, it, it's really uh, the reason I say it's deeply ingrained is because uh, <clears throat> I, I phone a lot of uh, the other survivors intentionally uh, quite regularly to let them know what I'm doing, let's say about my PhD and what, what it's all about. And I get very little response, but mm -hmm. after a while you kind of get used to that. And the reason I'm saying that uh, I'm grateful for some of the attempts that are being made lately to extend, let's say, communications about our experiences that um, a uh, former president of the denomination, George Erasmus, uh, I've asked him to write uh, what we call a blurb on my new book of stories. This one doesn't have anything to do with residential schools. It's just following on the Dene tradition of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And he tells me that he's collaborating with a Mohawk writer to put some of his thoughts and experiences on paper and so has the present uh, president of Dene Nation, Gerald Antoine. He's told me that uh, he's put together a small volume of, uh, of some of his uh, more, uh, memories, he says, in more poetic thought. And what happens with uh, events that have specifically to do with residential schools is that even though you don't get 100% of what you want, uh, what, what Gerald has told me was he really changed his outlook on, on his own personal involvement with things like residential schools, the Catholic Church and that, mm -hmm. with the latest trip overseas to the Vatican, in that afterwards he felt free to, to extend himself like that. Uh, but in my case, it has to do with uh, leaving a record for my grandchildren. Uh, mm -hmm. I've dedicated this first book uh, uh, from Bear Rock Mountain <clears throat> to my two sons. I don't wanna have any of my family members or relatives having an excuse for something that has happened that they want to brush aside. You cannot do that with history. And in, in certain parts of history, say the correlation between Nazi Germany and Canadian residential school experience, American boarding uh, schools, the correlation is becoming so close today with over 10,000 uh, bodies being found in former residential schools across the country. And out of 180, I believe, they've only uh, looked at probably less than 20. And when you come out with 10,000 out of that limited number, that tells you that it's more than just cultural genocide. What we're talking about is murder. We're talking about genocide on the same order as the Nazis rounding up the Germans with the uh, accommodation, collaboration of their own people in order to make uh, their vision of human destiny come true stilted as though it was and is. <clears throat> so I just thought I would mention some of those things. Right. I, yeah. Um, obviously, uh, I can only comprehend to some degree the, the things that you've gone through. And what made me reach out to you just over a year ago was watching the video of you speak um, from the Hall of Fame 
I watched a video of you of you being inducted into the Hall of Fame. And there was one part from that, I believe you mentioned in that speech, I definitely read it in the book, is that there's truly horrific atrocities that occur. But the I don't want to, there's no part that can be minimalized. But one of the things that hit me that is like a not not an afterthought, but when you're talking about um, crime to the extent of murder and and child, uh, the horrific um, atrocities committed to children, one thing was like that you were separated from your sister, who you were really, really close with at a very young age. And so you, because you were of the opposite sex, I believe you were very limited in how much you saw this person. And that's your your sister. And so I think as a father of two, just getting to the point of the understanding of my children being forced to be separated in that way, just because one of them happened to be a daughter, I happen to have two sons, but just thinking of the pain alone that it would cause me and my children if my if my two children couldn't see each other, just that is a, a very powerful like that alone um, affected me when I heard you speak. And um, th- it was it was those things. That's just the tip of the iceberg of the things that have happened. And, and to the same point as well, when you talk about the, the vast numbers of these mass graves, that doesn't even account for the numbers that weren't there. Like there was more, I'm sure, in those places where there's the mass graves, that's what they found. Um, just from other things that I've read there, you know, um, died, it's, it's pretty grotesque, but some kids probably, many kids probably didn't even make it to the mass graves in those, in those locations. So even those numbers for those schools is probably inaccurate. Well, it, uh, it appoints to um, a discrepancy, let's say, in the way we look at things and the way we are taught to uh, interpret them. Mm-hmm. Up to this point, even though the numbers have topped over 10,000, initially everybody guessed maybe 5,000, but when you reach over 10,000 out of 153,000 students, that is criminal negligence, that is murder. Mm-hmm. But because it happened to the Indians, nobody cares about it. You'll notice. These kinds of things happen even, well, especially today. In Ukraine, for instance, people extending themselves to provide any kind of aid towards these people because they're white. That's basically Mm -hmm. what it is. That's the underlying truth we don't Mm -hmm. want to look at. And the situation in Texas, the police didn't respond to that situation of uh, killings in the school because most of the students are Mexican. Mm -hmm. You have to look at things squarely and I'm glad that you are doing so as a parent. You're you're not looking away just because it's not entertaining for you or whatever Mm -hmm. people gauge their uh, daily interpretations on their daily preferences. This is a kind of a situation where Canada is presented with a grade A opportunity to know something of their own history. I'll give you uh, an example of that. This works both ways. Back in the um, earliest days, when we completed our secondary school education and wanted to get involved in social change in the north to stop a pipeline, for instance. I took a couple of uh, American tourists all the way up to the Arctic coast by boat. That was the year 1970, I believe. And when we got to the end, they asked me if uh, I wanted to see what they were doing. And it turned out these were two Anglican ministers that were organizing the first of uh, a total of, I think, 12 ecumenical conferences. The first one was held in uh, um, Crow Indian Agency in Montana. These were like uh, a revival of the Indian spirit, basically. And there was about a decade of it that went on in Morley, Alberta. And when I went 
went to the first one, we got to tour the Custer battlefield in uh, Montana. I picked up the book, uh, Bury, Heart, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee by Dee Brown. Mm -hmm. And when I got to about the middle of it, I just could not believe it that this had really happened. And I was given a very stilted uh, education about my own history. So I put it down thinking, well, I, I can't handle this. You know, I, I can represent our people on the streets protesting and whatever it takes, but I really cannot um, understand or interpret uh, logically what this is all about, the, mm -hmm. uh, the theft of the American West. And it continued with the starvation of the Indians, the Cree on the uh, Canadian plains with uh, when McDonald was prime minister at the time. And, but after, after a few months, I thought to myself, well, this is your own history. You know, you, you can't put that aside. Mm -hmm. This is what really happened to your people. Try to learn it. So I read the rest of the book. And what happens when you get through the, let's say the confused confusion or misinterpretation of, or whatever it is that you as a person put into your own understanding, then you have a more mature outlook on what you can present to other people. In other words, a more impersonal interpretation of, of what is really going on. Right. And well, what I think is happening with the, the apathy that I mentioned before is it's all about anger. I know it's all about anger because it even happens to me once in a while. I go through a very angry PTSD, just like a former prisoner of war or a active soldier or anything like that. I went, I was taken way over the edge of logical experience in a concerted effort to kill my spirit. And I survived that. And I have to be able to gather those pieces without the anger. But to use that anger as a fuel to make a better interpretation, a better, a better uh, possibility for the future, let's say. So I'm able to talk logically with non-survivors and try to help them interpret what it is they need to know mm -hmm. yeah um <clears throat> when you're talking about as well um documenting things um knowing some people that's family comes from from israel or jewish descendants um that they many survivors of the holocaust would make videos they recorded these videos i believe they did a lot of it in the 90s and grandchildren and children watch these videos later. These videos were made by themselves, and then people saw them after, and they could better understand what those people went through and maybe some of the actions that they took and how that affected their generationally, how it affected generationally the, the, the children and the grandchildren and great-grandchildren afterwards. And when you think about some of the most powerful films um, that I've seen is sometimes putting a very um, taking away the veneer of war being some hero creating concept and really being a tragic, horrific event that destroys population bases. And, um, you know, you don't, you don't make things better and evolve things going forward by ignoring the past. You have to like bluntly run into it and really understand it to make changes that are necessary because if you don't if you don't um properly understand it then how can you make solutions or make amends or or affect things going forward or help the individuals themselves if you really don't know what they've been through that that is a very vital outlook on this kind of a situation is that uh, the reason why I'm always on about uh, residential schools being a concerted effort um, by the Canadian government and the Roman Catholic Church to kill the Indian spirit, 
is that even at the time it was happening, the only times that we got to see our own relatives and our own parents was in the summertime. This was a more, let's say, laid back time of the year, the months of uh, July and August. We still had work to do because uh, a, a lot of communities at the time uh, weren't set up the way they are today. We were out at the fish camps and hunting camps. So just at the time when it was um, um, about ready for the fall moose hunt, when we as young boys could uh, prove ourselves as valuable members of the community, we were taken away and not politely so either with complicity of the RCMP. They came and picked you up physically in their boat. You went and flew off to some unknown experience yet again for 10 months of the year. And all those winter months that we were um, in captivity, let's say, without any identity, the, the girls, they couldn't exercise their um, hide tanning skills, their sewing skills, their cooking skills. They, we didn't have any of that. So when we came back to our communities, we were actually blamed by our own people for not having those skills. Um, they, they told us it was our fault, even though it was not our fault that we had been begun to lose our languages. So that separation, that wanting to uh, um, be a model Canadian citizen, that kind of thing. It still carried on, you know, those favorites of the nuns and the priests, you know, are now the politicians, that kind of thing, you know, that kind of uh, trying to put the shine on the Canadian picture, you know, wanting people going crazy over Prince Philip coming to Deda or Dilo of all places, you know, that kind of thing still exists. And decolonization, it's a very long extended, extended and personal experience. A lot of our people would rather just not uh, want to uh, speak our language even to their own children. It's just picking up now. I noticed that there are language classes and moose hide uh, tanning uh, courses going on, so it's slowly coming back into our our possession. But still, we have to uh, learn what it is that we went through, what we survived, what it is. We should be proud of the fact that we're still alive. Yeah, and um, what a lot of people might not know that I've learned more and more from living in the north is that it wasn't so and there is still people there's a community for instance called samba k where there's much um a, my understanding i haven't had the opportunity to go there yet but um the vast majority of that community still basically lives on the land a large part and so how recently um the dene and um lived on the land in a sense of like you i, I believe i read that you guys were making your canoe and you'd fish at this time of year and you travel and um and the other thing for people that may not be aware is the vastness of this area that we're in the northwest territories alone not counting in nunavut is about one five one point five million kilometers squared ontario is about one million kilometers squared um, with a much lesser population it is a huge region that's very hard to travel so there's many communities now that you can only fly to i recently went to Inuvik. i you can't drive directly there from Yellowknife. it's it's 1200 kilometers and there's mountain ranges and everything um so it's how recently and how much of a cultural shock it would have been that that the people were still living this this life that was so different than what you're being forced into when you were brought to a i believe right <clears throat> so you mentioned somebody 
I believe that is the name for Kikiza, but Yellowknife, where, where you probably are right now, is Somba K, money town. Oh, Somba. Ah, yeah. Somba. There's right. two. Somba is uh, their word for trout, I believe. Somba yeah, K is the name of that community over there. Yeah, they, they call it Trout Lake or Samba K often. Yeah, so, Samba yeah. K. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> But you're touching on some very valuable points right there. I'll give you an example of, uh, let's say, the interpretation between generations of the residential school experience. For about uh, 10 years, I was working with the ITI, uh, let's say it's uh, Industry, Tourism and Investments, I believe. Uh, to highlight the um, arts of the Satu. And when I got to the community of Tulita, where there are more mountain Denny over there, we were um, in their hotel, their Grey Goose Lodge, I believe it's called over there. And we set up in the boardroom. And before I started in on the arts project itself. I wanted to uh, uh, open up with some remarks about the general direction we wanted to go in, how we wanted to highlight the, the cultural life of the Dene with whatever uh, artistic skills people were practicing in. And just as I was beginning to start, on the TV came on the, uh, the official apology, federal government apology. So there was uh, Harper, I believe, prime minister at the time making his apology. And I just decided to, to watch it with the group. And I told him just uh, uh, pay attention to what, what this is going to mean for the future and about your own experiences in residential schools, then we'll just go around the uh, table and, and talk about it in our own language, which we did. Each person that was present there got to say whatever it is they wanted to say about residential schools. And then when we got to the very end, it was my late grand uncle Morris uh, Mendel, I believe he passed away last winter. But he started talking about his older generation, how they didn't experience everything that their own children did in residential schools. They were still familiar with the land and they were still living on the land till about the late 1950s, early 1960s when the move started to um, into the communities. And he said, after a while, he noticed two things that were having happening to the people. He says, people started getting competitive over things that they didn't, uh, they were sharing before. Um, he was talking about jobs, the limited number of jobs there were in a community and that there was a lot of competition for those competi uh, for those positions because that was an income for the family. And then he also mentioned that people had to go further out of the community for, <clears throat> for wood, for, um, uh, for firewood. So again, it was costing them more to live in the community than they would have in on their own on the land because when you're on the land you can provide all your own food you don't have to work for it the wood is nearby and then he said that started changing people and their mood went towards uh, alcohol abuse and you started think, uh, seeing things that that weren't happening there before and that gave us a very valuable insight into the way that we had changed, um, not personally as individuals, but the way our people 
had been forced into a direction that we didn't necessarily need to go. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of uh, was a saving grace in a way, I suppose, that the, our political involvement involved just that, the decolonization of our people that we wanted to eventually get to a spot that we are in today. We had a big argument over a financial report. Uh, was it last summer or the summer before in Fort Good Hope with our Yamoka Land Corporation? People were making personal attacks against people that were voted in to represent our business interests. And I just had to step in and say, well, this is not a court of law. If you have a case to make against an individual, bring it to the police, take it to the court, hire a lawyer, do whatever it is, but do not point fingers at each other because just a few years ago, back maybe two or three decades ago, something like that, we were still living on the land. There was nobody in town except for, you know, the, um, RCMP, the mm -hmm. church. But now we have our own lawyer, we have our own doctor, and I'm studying to do a PhD. We are getting somewhere. Mm -hmm. Let's not tear each other apart just because of personal dislikes. This episode is brought to you by Sport North. They support territorial sport organizations throughout the Northwest Territories and works towards the education and implementation of programs in cooperation with many governing bodies. Please check them out at Sport North. Oh, that apathy I was talking about, it might not be a personal uh, situation. In your case, maybe it's a podcast that you want to uh, further, which is good. But part of that is putting forth a value, valuable message about residential schools. Mm -hmm. Back A and so back A, things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you but... must be talking about so back A because... Looking at you, you, you look like a very rich man to me. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm located in Sombake. Um, my, I'm, I'm, so my job is a judo coach. And so I travel, I have the opportunity to travel through the territory and teach judo throughout the territory. So one community, um, I, I don't want to mispronounce the name, but Fort Providence, get uh, get you could say the name better than myself, but um, I travel there on a, on a regular basis. And when you were talking about, um, about seeing some of these things come back, that's one community in particular that I can see that I've seen is like how much they're utilizing the Dene Jati language and the kids go out and, and go on the land, which is really beautiful to me. And the other thing is that I think some people may not, um, you know, different understanding of different communities and a lot of people have never been here is when you're talking about how quickly things change and how that led to stress and and infighting is this wasn't like a couple generations of people living here as as inhospitable as the land may seem especially if you're just visiting um some of the oldest cave paintings ever found were in our neighboring territory in the yukon i believe it's called the blue caves and they were found in the late 1960s over 25 uh, I want to say it's I can't remember then I should look it up but maybe 25,000 years ago they have cave paintings in the Yukon in the northern Yukon so this is um, so many generations that people lived in these communities and things changed so dramatically and um, you know the communal living when you start introducing different things being forced upon those uh, upon the people that are living there um, that's going to have massive ripple effects, you know, like, like you're saying, you're living on the land, you're doing things communally and building these things and working like extended families. And then there's these jobs being pushed onto you that weren't a necessity before and how that can totally change power dynamics and the, the situation in the community. Uh, some of those changes are not really necessary, you know, uh, there's, there's no real push in the north that I know of for a highway to extend all the way from wherever it is now, uh, 
the Wrigley all the way to the Arctic coast because some of those communities, they just don't want to be bothered with the outside world. Even when I grew up, the community of Fort Group was only about 300 people. Now it's, oh, I don't know, six, seven, eight hundred people like that. But it's still remote because people want to keep it that way. Um, <clears throat> when I ask, I, I do a lot of work with the youth at home with doing murals for the community, that kind of thing. And when I ask them why they, uh, why they don't want to leave the community and further their secondary school education, they just tell me that they feel that they have everything they have right in the community now. They can go out hunting anytime they want. It's the best moose hunting country in the North. It's got uh, some of the best scenery in the North. There's no real push for a lot of um, tourism, that kind of commercializing your culture and that kind of involvement with the outside world, showcasing a life that you're already living in luxury too, you know? And I'm glad that you... Um, um, pointed out that situation with the cave paintings over in the Yukon. There's places like that in the North too, you know, it's the same, basically the same country. Mm -hmm. Some, uh, I can't remember how many years ago that it was, uh, somebody in the community of uh, Tukajik, um the young man said that he had uh, gone out after every heavy rain to see if there was uh, anything that was uncovered. And what he found was uh, the, the carcass with the meat and the hide fur still on of a, a prehistoric bison that's just close to Inuvik. And that that skeleton that remains was like 15,000 years old. So even of our stories, I just finished a series of paintings to, to finish off my PhD. Hope uh, there's going to be an art show here at the Art Gallery of Peterborough, probably next uh, April. These Paintings date back from stories that I was told by my grandparents of a time when they say the world was new, when dinosaurs were still walking around. These are like 15, 20,000 year old lifestyle. I had to put myself into that kind of a situation. And it helps when you were born right on the land, like many of my generation were that you have that close of a connection with that kind of way of life. And uh, I have a art mentor uh, who is very well recognized in the indigenous community, Bonnie Devine. She won a Order of Canada some months ago. And she's impressed with that set of 21 paintings from that so many years ago. And when you're talking about cave paintings, you know, that, that's not only in other places. There's one story about um, a young girl who was sent out. What happened at the time was that when the young girls reached the age of menstruation, they were set apart from the community not far away because, uh, you know, you go in any direction for about 10 minutes and you're back in the middle of nowhere. They wanted right. to keep an eye on her. So they sent her out to this cave. And what, what happened was that the, um, the cave collapsed on her, well, exactly where, where she was in the cave in a way. And 
later on, the community members wanted to see the spot. And when they finally found it, what they found in there was uh, uh, drawings on the, on the cave walls, that kind of thing, you know? So what we think of as a long time ago is still very much present in the North. Mm -hmm. That is that, um, that kind of hand to mouth existence that is still possible in some places, you know? So mm -hmm. I, I strongly believe that it's still possible to regain the kind of Dene identity that we used to have at one time. Mm -hmm. But that sense of shame that we keep carrying along for, around for no reason at all these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Victims have a, in many different forms of having been through trauma, often find a way to internalize that as a fault that they must have committed for that trauma to have occurred to them. And I don't think that's often, it's often not a conscious decision, but the repercussions are the same nonetheless. So I can only imagine on something on such a grand scale to your people it's really going to feel like our people must have done something because everyone you know went through this um this horrific uh history and um that was that was hidden from or not spoken about um by most of the world for a very 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 long time <clears throat> that uh that sense of anger that underlies all the reaction to that kind of a situation is very real. And I often run up against it with my own uh, colleagues, let's say, people that I'm trying to work with, my own relatives, you know, refusing to share any of their own experiences because you have to be able to look at things and interpret them willingly before you can uh, get anywhere as a human being. Mm -hmm. One group of people that understand this very well are our Inuit uh, relatives. They have a saying that says, never in anger. That means don't do something because of your personal strong dislike for doing it or doing it in any particular way. If you're feeling overwhelmed by that anger, don't, don't carry on with what you're doing. Uh, just relax, try to understand what it is all about. And the, there's a story about uh, the way they bring out uh, new hunters amongst the Inuit is they practice uh, a kind of hypnosis, let's say, that's about as close as I can get to it. They, convince the teenager that whatever is going to happen out on the land is supposed to go that way. It's supposed to end up with a positive result. And almost 100% of their result involves coming back with a successful kill. That means that the young hunter on the very first try in a very difficult uh, uh, country is able to provide for the community with the right kind of support, not that con condemnation or disregard for language or culture that we went through. So there has to be something to it, never in anger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can only imagine how difficult that could be. You know, for 12 years I lived in Toronto and someone pulls out in front of your car and this very minor thing where you're totally okay can make you so angry. So, you know, like you can, you can have road rage, which is like really common. And so it would, it's a very, it would take a very strong person and um, maybe a lot of support and, and I'm not sure, but to, to be able to operate without utilizing anger in that situation given the history, if that makes sense. It's a kind of uh, <clears throat> collective anger, collective 
paranoia, collective uh, manipulation of events in order to have it interpreted in the future a certain way. I'll give you the best example I know is uh, Hannah Arendt. Are you familiar with that name? No. She was a Jewish, um, um, a German Jew that, that was sent to a concentration camp. She survived the concentration camp for nine months and escaped to uh, Switzerland and eventually made her way to emigrate to the USA. And she was like a social political psychologist, more a social psychologist. And uh, when, um, when Adolf Eichmann was finally captured in Argentina, I believe uh, early 70s, somewhere in there, mm -hmm. uh, she was already a journalist. So the, I believe it was the Atlantic Monthly asked her to go over there to the uh, trial in, um, in Israel, which ended up uh, like a, more of a show trial. But the trial itself of the war criminal Adolf Eichmann went on for nine months. And uh, as, as a communicator yourself, you have to find an angle, the right kind of questions, the right kind of approach to what, what, what you want to portray, right? Mm -hmm. So her situation had to do with getting some kind of uh, clue about this person. And what she thought to herself was that um, here was a person that looked just like a factory worker, just like your next door neighbor, somebody that you would borrow tools from, whatever. But the heinous crimes that he was accused of did not seem to match the person. And that's what she was um, trying to, um, to, to get a hold of. And she came up uh, with a phrase called the banality of evil, which is also a title of her book. And probably a movie was made of that about her life. I think it's called Hannah Arendt. Mm -hmm. And what, what uh, she found out was Eichmann himself was actually a Zionist. And he wanted the Jews to be um, sent off to... Um, Africa. That's what he wanted, just to um, not to have to deal with that particular situation. But when the order came down from the Fuhrer to have all the Jews in, in Europe killed, that became his job. And one, one thing led to another. And as Hannah Arendt started uh, visualizing and interpreting the situation of um, you know, what the Holocaust was all about. She ran up into the brick wall of the Israeli uh, government telling her that she was on the side of the Germans. Whereas what she was getting at was a deeper truth, a mm -hmm. deeper human truth that that kind of evil, banal in the sense that it's unnoticeable, that it goes by just like a lot of the everyday things that we just couldn't be concerned about. Mm -hmm. Like that shooting in Texas, why the police didn't respond, you know. Mm -hmm. um, what, what she was talking about is that that kind of evil, maybe not necessarily to that extent, exists in everybody. It exists in you, it exists in myself. Everybody mm -hmm. has a little bit of that. That's mm -hmm. why it kind of gets ignored so much. Mm -hmm. But that the human condition is, is not going to change until the last person agrees that something wrong has been done. In the, mm -hmm. in the case of uh, uh, Canadian experience with residential schools, 
I am gratified, you know, that people at least are, are hearing about it here. In the US, it's not an issue at all. Boarding schools is a non-entity. Mm -hmm. It's just like part of that melting pot over there. Mm -hmm. But in our situation, we have the um, um, choice, let's say, the possibility of knowing what it is that Hannah Arendt is trying to get at. What mm -hmm. she's saying is that it might only um, be interpreted as a human evil that is something of the past. What she's saying is not until we each uh, regain our responsibility for what is possible from knowing the facts in that, in, that, in that particular case, then it's not just one person like the war criminal who is at fault. Everybody mm -hmm. has a little bit of that. Even some of the Nazi top ranks knew what they were doing and why it would work mm -hmm. is because in the end, people found it easier to do it the way they wanted to, tyranny, in other words. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I guess, obviously, the um, I'm hoping that people find the conversation valuable of, of enlightening people that may not fully understand it and getting to hear it from an individual that obviously went through it themselves. And the other part that I think makes your particular story so powerful is um, from the little bit that I've gotten to know you over the last year is the way that you were able to navigate through it. Um, obviously, I'm sure there's many remnants and you have many tough days like people do, but um, that you were able to sort of um, pour your energy into so many things. and um, and utilize that to, to live this incredible life that you've led. There's the expression about um, a jack of all trades, but master of none, but often better than a master of one is the last part of that phrase that's often missed is, is, um, is being amazing at all those things is often better than being at, good at just one thing. And um, I believe like my understanding is part of what helped you get through that was pouring your energy into art and pouring your energy into um, being physical and, and like, there's the incredible story that I heard of when you went to the Canada winter games and it was in Quebec city in February and you guys did the race in your t-shirts because it felt so warm coming from, <laughs> from Fort Good Hope and living in Inuvik. And for people that are unaware geographically, Inuvik is North of the, of the Arctic circle. It's about two hours drive South from the Arctic ocean. So yeah, yeah, in, incredibly cold territory and, and that you were able to utilize, uh, utilize your energy in such a positive way to have an escape from, from what you were going through. Well, it, uh, <clears throat> my mentor has always been my late grandfather, Peter Mountain Sr. And uh, there was a time that I was, doing uh, library and information sciences, uh, sciences because I wanted to set up uh, then a museum library in Fort Good Hope. And um, I would always call home every once in a while just to find out what was going on. And then my uncle, Peter Mountain Jr., he told me your your friend here, your grandfather, your number one friend one, wants you to come back home. And in our culture, when you hear that from your grandparents, there's, there's no discussion, there's no argument. You just leave whatever you're doing, you go there and you find out what's going on. So not knowing if it was wise or not, I just left um, the library and information sciences um, course that I was doing there at Lakehead University. And when I got back home, my grandfather, he was uh, talking to me about um, their situation. He said, we, we don't ask something for no reason, you know. He said, myself and your grandmother were both going to be dead 
in four years time. He said, our generation of Dene, we know exactly how we're gonna die and when we're gonna die. That that's how well we know our life. But he said, you're the one person we really want to have around towards the end, you know, to, to, to share some of the things we know with you. Because he said, uh, you, your understanding of uh, education, it might, it might be over here amongst the Mola, amongst the white people, but it's a little bit lower, he said, amongst the Dene because of your language, he said, you need to touch up. He says, only if you understand things in Dene are you an intelligent person, he said. Other than that, it's just facts, it's just information. It's just like pieces of paper. It doesn't have anything to do with you. You have to know what kind of human being you are. So I spent a lot of time with them. I would cut uh, wood. I set up a camp outside of the community over the winters and cut wood. And I just got the band council to build a road to where I was and haul the wood for the elders, just for the elders. And then over all that time, I would spend as much time as I could with them. And each time I went there, he gave me a Dene education. Same way as you get an education from an elder when you go out hunting with them. For instance, the first time you go out with an elder, they'll just talk about the weather. They'll say, what, what is the best kind of weather to be in one part of the country? How can you read the weather without a book in your hand, without looking at anything? Just looking at the land, how can you stay safe? How can you know where the animals are going to be so that you can go and get them for the community? And so they start from there, they go into evidence of uh, life on the land, tracks of different animals, they say, when you start reading the land like a book, it's just, it's just like a newspaper. It tells you exactly what's going on in that particular season, if it's safe to travel or not. And then slowly he was, they were taking me back to a time which became very valuable for me recently doing all those paintings of, uh, of life on the land, the way the people uh, regard it the dead, the way they regarded, valued each other as relatives, as human beings, in that uh, they were taking me to a time that they were involved with too, when there was no such thing as candles. There was no such thing as tea, sugar, flour, guns, anything, knives. They had to make everything, traps. Mm -hmm. They had none of those things. How did they associate with the um, with the animals and the land that is the coldest in the world and do it in luxury? That's what they were trying to tell me about. And he was bringing me to mind of what I wanted to do too. What he was saying is, He's telling me that if you have a dream, he said, you want something to come true in your life, you have to work at it every single day to make it come true. No matter how long it takes, when it comes true, nobody can take it away from you because you're the only one that worked on it. It really makes sense to me when he, it was like sitting at the foot of a king, the way he spoke to me mm -hmm. in a very humble and controlled voice. He made me to understand very complicated 
things that I would probably never be able to reach his kind of understanding in my lifetime. Things that he took for granted that he wanted to pass on to me, especially about the future, because you dedicate yourself to what, what you're wanting to do. In your case, teach judo to the Dene and whoever it is in the North. It will come true because you have that knowledge. You have that commitment. You have that dream. You want that for yourself and for your ch children in the future. You don't want it just to say, well, I did that because I'm a great person. That has nothing to do with it. You have to keep that humility. You see all those heroes, you know, they, they die young, Michael Jackson, that kind of thing. They want to live forever, but that's impossible. Mm -hmm. That's because they're forgetting about their own human essence. They're taking the glory out of the human condition, the human experience for themselves. They're forgetting that there's a spiritual value in what they're trying to do. They have, they have to maintain that spiritual connection in their everyday lives, not to put themselves above anybody else, you know, because in one way or another, even somebody sharing uh, an ind individual thought, it helps you carry on what you're planning to do. You know, that they, they may not know that they're contributing to what you're doing, but in their own way, they are, you know, and there's a, there's a good virtue in that, you know, there's a really solid kind of humility in there that's, that's going to make it possible to carry on. Right. The, the, the one thing that you were talking about that I find is a fascinating concept and a really interesting thing as well is when you're talking about the way that your grandparents lived and how different it was, the, the part that I find fascinating in a sense is how recently, especially here, even more recently, but how recently modern life is. And we're <clears throat> modern time society people. We like to think things are the way they are now and we sort of imagine because it's what we know that this is how life always was. And one thing that's really interesting to me about yourself is that you sort of lived both lives of, of living on the land as a small child and then seeing modern life now and life for hundreds of thousands of years was not what it is now. This window of how we live now as if this is the utopian time or whatever is such a brief time in human existence that we've lived this way. When in reality, um, your people and, and the Dene and the Inuit lived like this for so many thousands year of years. And what that means to have lived that way for so many thousands of years and what that knowledge is, right? That's like millennia of knowledge of living that way in those conditions and in these places compared to how much knowledge can people even have from such a short period of time of living this way that's changing all the time. That's a good point. <clears throat> but it's the difference between experience and just uh, gathering information, you know, mm -hmm. and bushcraft around here, you know, we're relatively remote. But the questions they're asking are what is the best kind of a sleeping bag or best kind of knife or something like that. That really reminds me of um, Morris Mendel, my grand uncle, the late Morris Mendel was also a very wise man, my grandfather's brother. The CBC was asking him all kind of, all kind of questions about people wanting to go back to live on the land the way that uh, their parents did or anything like that. And uh, they were telling him that um, when they talked to uh, a dog musher in the North, uh, Chief Johnny Charlie, the late Chief Johnny Charlie, that he told them that you have to start out with some good equipment, um, a set of dogs anyway. 
team of dogs and harness and sled and you need a tent and a stove and gun and axe and everything to go along with that and you need to know where you're going so you need to have some experience of life on the land where the trails are or anything like that and they asked Morris Mendel about that how much equipment uh, how, how do you need to be be prepared to be on the land Morris Mendel he told him you don't need any of that he said all you need it's a pair of gum boots. You put your boots on and you go out. <laughs> right, right. He's talking about experience. He says, just go out there. Mm -hmm. you know, you'll find out what you need. Right. You go out there and you're cold. You need to have an axe. Right. If you shoot something, you need a knife to cut it up. If, if you need to cook it, you need a stove, you need a frying pan, you just kind of gather everything together, you know? Mm -hmm. But that knowledge that the um, ancestors have, let's say, it's something that you cannot replace, you know? It, it was there at one time and it's just slowly disappearing. Mm -hmm. At the time that I was cutting wood for the elders, you know, um, <clears throat> One of my late father's best friends, Louis Caesar, he calls me Salabaya, my son, my friend's son. He called me that. He always took special interest in me for some reason. And he wanted to talk with me about that. He, just, he said, I heard you're out there somewhere on the land cutting wood for the elders, and we keep, we keep getting wood from you. And we don't have to pay for it or anything. Tell them, well, that, that's the way it should be, you know. Elders mm -hmm. don't need to work for or pay for something, you know. They mm -hmm. work all their lives. At least they should have some heat, you know. Mm -hmm. Maybe some, we, we, we share food anyway, but wood, it's, it's kind of like a specialized uh, thing, you know. It's, uh, it's mm -hmm. just one of those things that, I think the elders should have. And he said, well, that's good to know. He said, but over there where you are, are you out there all by yourself? No, um, no neighbors or anything? Oh, yeah, I like it like that. People talk too much when you're a neighbor, you know, they talk for no reason. Right. So I, I just like that, you know, I, I just like being out there, except for one squirrel. He was telling me that the squirrel is my only neighbor mm -hmm. in the morning. He makes a certain kind of a sound that's like a bugle, like that. Right. That's for me. I got to go to work. So I right. take my chainsaw and my uh, axe and go and cut wood and then. Around the middle of the day, I hear that same squirrel in the tree over here this time going, katsak, 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 katsak. That means time for something to eat. <laughs> huh? I go back and have something to eat, and then the squirrel make a different sound, keeping me company. I go back, and then at the end of the day, it makes that sound again. Katsak, 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 katsak. Mm -hmm. That means your day is done. Right. And relax. And he said, Remember, I asked you if you're by yourself. He said, Tom, yeah, I'm always by myself in the bush. It's safer that way for me. Mm -hmm. He said, Well, what about the squirrel? You know, yeah, the squirrel is there too, but you know, it lives there. That's me, he said. Hmm. That's me keeping you company. He said, Us elders, we really like to get our wit for free from you, but I want to share your experience with you and tell you what to do at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, that's it's awesome. It's a belief system, you know, that belongs something in the past, but something that we can carry on, you know. Mm -hmm. I have my dinner name, you know. Mm -hmm. My two sons have dinner names. My three grandsons have done in names. It's that identity that we lost, you know. 
Right. You need to regain that identity. Once you get your identity back, it's like your own clothes, you know. You feel comfortable in those clothes. You feel comfortable. Then it is on. Then it echoes a general long on as It's really good for you to in, interpret yourself in your own language. We tell stories, you know, that, that's uh, part of our culture. My second book, um, Child of Morning Star, it's going to be out in the fall. It's just stories. That's part of our Dene traditions mm -hmm. to express ourselves in that way. But in, in order to be able to, to do that, you have to watch how the elders did it. They were real masters, and there's no comparison at all. In English, it's like, you know, eating dry crackers without any butter or anything on it, without any mm -hmm. salt. But when you tell a story in Dene, it comes to life, you know. Right. I'll give you an example. Is, um, every community that I went to to do murals for the community, I would try to figure out where it would go, what it would involve, and who I should talk to about it. When I was in Tulita, they were talking about the, the, the youth uh, swimming pool that they wanted to build a building for the young people that they could swim. And I thought, you know that old time story of how the world was created by the muskrat, how the world was made by the muskrat. That would be a valuable story to, to know. But if you go to any elder, at all, you know, you, you'll get the official version because that's the way it has to be. You can't add anything to it. It has to remain as an oral tradition. Uh, the uh, the storyline goes like that. But when you go to certain ones, like uh, Morris Mendel, for instance, a master storyteller and um, uh, a knowledge keeper of the old, old ways, old way of looking at things closer to the earth, closer to the creator's plan, that kind of thing. I went over to him and he said, well, it's going to take a while, you know, but we'll, uh, we'll get to that. And then he said, but before I tell you the story, you have to go and, uh, talk to one of the local teachers. I didn't know what he was talking about. So I went to that teacher, that Mola, white woman teacher. And I told her, I, I've never met you, but uh, my, my grandfather's brother Morris says I should talk to you about something and you'll know what it is. And she said, well, I can only guess, seeing as how you are Dene men, she says, you're mountain Dene men. You're always after the woman. <laughs> <laughs> he said, Morris is jealous of you because he thinks that I have eyes only for you. Mm. She told me that. Mm. I thought, oh, well, I haven't even met you. How could he feel like that? I says, well, you know, you're a Denny man, you should know. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I figured, well, if this is the problem, I have to solve it. So I opened up a, uh, a Russian dating site on my computer. Okay. I brought it over to my late uh, granduncle and I showed it to him. And he's looking at all these beautiful women and he's going, he says, he says, grandson, he said, these very beautiful women here, are they all for me? <laughs> I told her, yeah, I told her, yeah, you pick anyone you want, and they'll even come over here and marry you. Right. And he says, 
planeado para senhor Rodrigo na razão o país planeado e que era o seu também se só se só pa se só um ba se não o senhor eu não sei que o senhor zani é que é یک اینیا اوتاهی، he says. he said if there is such a beautiful woman like that، he said. I'm gonna go hunting. I'm gonna make a real nice carpet of moose hide right from my truck to my bedroom. her her feet do not need to touch the ground. right. so everything was okay، and then he told me that story. The way it should be told, the way the muskrat, how muskrat created the world, and the advantage of the elders is they acted out. So even impersonating all the different animals, trying to get to the the dirt at the bottom of the ocean when there was a big flood, and how the only the muskrat could do it, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's that kind of outlook that you have. As you say, something from the past, you know, in my case, and something of the future too. And this is the reason I like to work with the youth is whether we like it or not, whether we disagree with each other or not, you know, it's only the, the children, it's only the grandchildren, it's only the young, the youth that have the answer to what the future is going to look like. So we need to treat them the right way. We, mm -hmm. we need to give them the right information. We need to give them that kind of extra spirit, that extra push. I know for a fact that they have everything that we say they don't have, you know what I mean? We mm -hmm. say they don't know how to speak their language. That's not true. When I work with them, they speak their language real good without any accent or all. And this is probably the most difficult language in the world to, to learn is Dene. It's like Navajo. It was used as a military code because nobody could figure out what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. I only know a handful of people that know how to speak our language properly. Mm -hmm. And the youth have picked it up really well. They know how to hunt too. They know how to behave on the land safely, you know. Mm -hmm. They know, the best of all, they know how to share with the community. You know, they don't just keep everything for themselves. They don't take credit for anything themselves. Even now they're doing the moose hide tanning course in Fort Good Hope. None of the organizers for it take any credit for themselves. That's a sign of a good leader, you know, somebody that's volunteering to the nth degree, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's, that's, it's really, it's, it's really awesome to hear that. And, uh, and I just want to say, like, um, we, we met in person before, and we had a couple phone calls before, but to get to have another long conversation with you, I always enjoy our conversations thoroughly, and I always find it super educational, and I'm very, like, um, humbled by you taking all this time to have this conversation with me, so I hope you enjoyed um, spreading and telling your stories. Whenever I, whenever I tell someone that we've met, or I've had a conversation with you, or that I've been reading your book, or whatever, the the feedback I get from everyone that I know that's aware of you is always the same thing. Uh, Antoine is a heck of a storyteller. That's what everyone always says to me whenever, <laughs> whenever your name comes up. So, uh, so thank you for, for, um, for giving me that time and, and having that conversation with me. And, and I hope you enjoyed it as well. Well, it's the youth, you know, I always try to make a special attempt. Whenever the youth are doing something, they can't be doing it alone. They have to have some kind of, uh, guidance or input from the older generation, you know, because that's what creates the foundation of what um, what can happen in the future. Anything is possible, you know what I mean? Anything, mm -hmm. it's because the energy is there. We, as the older generation, we lose that energy we used to have but we still keep the uh, interpretation for what it, what it all means, 
you know, but I'm always um, impressed with what what the youth are capable of, you know, and in my own, my father was chief for 25 years, maybe I'll just mention this as a, as an ending kind of thing, is that, um, so I grew up in the household of the chief, that is leadership in practice. And we never talked about any of the details of individual problems of people with their names attached, never accused people of being any kind of way about the situation they were finding themselves in. All we ever talked about was making sure, making sure that some of the people had a place to live. So even as a family, our names came very last when it was time for a new house. We waited until my father's position as chief was over. And then we asked for a house. And my mother, she never spoke a word of English in her life. We, we hardly ever heard any English, except for my father and even himself, he, he knew some other Denny languages too. But my mother always put it into perspective for us. And what she said is, it's really good to share things with each other. She said, when you have something in mind to share with somebody, it could be something that you notice about them or something you want to give them or things like that. She said, as soon as that thought happens in your mind, they are your boss already. She said, you're working for them. They're your boss. You have to ask them what it is they like, you know, what it is they like to talk about, remember, you know, what's their favorite clothing or things to have or anything. That'll give you a direction of uh, what your boss wants you to do for you. Up until the time that you give that gift to them, they're your boss. And then you're free afterwards, she said. But when you give something to them, you're forgiving yourself. That's what you're doing, she said. Everybody did something wrong. Some things you don't want anybody to know about. But that gift, in exchange, it knows the situation. You need to be forgiven just a little bit. That's the way we live. She says, you're, you're not doing it out of kindness of your heart, although it has something to do with it. She says, you need that. You need that forgiveness. You need that good feeling to carry on. And that's what our Denny tradition is all about, she said. Mm. That good feeling. Nothing else. He said it doesn't mm. have anything to do with what you have or what you know or anything like that. She said it's what you're willing to share with somebody else about yourself. That's where, that's where we live as Denny people, she says. And really made a lot of sense to me, you know? Mm -hmm. Sort of like yeah. making making amends for all the crimes that you've committed. Sharing that is is sort of making amends for it so that you can continue on living in a healthy way. It extends to other situations too. She really did not like paper, any kind of paper. She said it was not the truth. And anything that has to be written down is not the truth. So anything that was paper went into the fire right away. First, that my father was that was sent to my father as chief. So she'd be starting the fire, and my father is telling her, "What are you doing that? Well, right. What are you doing with that? That's a letter from the Prime Minister of Canada. That right. person comes here and starts my fire for me. Then I can keep his paper." 
other than that, it goes into the fire. That's how right. he's going to help me. <laughs> all right. All right. Wild. That's awesome. Well, thank, thank you, you again for that, and, and I hope we uh, cross paths and get to speak again soon. Well, Josh, will you take care? Thank you. All right. Merci. Thank you.